Welcome to today's Freedom Club podcast featuring Zach Messler and your host, Kurt Mercadante. Now let's meet the starting lineups. At guest, a 6'4 marketer from Washington, D.C., number five, Zach Messler. And at host, a larger-than-life mindset coach from Charleston, South Carolina, number one, Kurt Mercadante. Welcome to the Freedom Club Podcast, where we discover the fight for freedom, fulfillment, passion, and purpose. Your host is Kurt Mercadante, Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, an agency founder who is dedicated to coaching individuals seeking to level up their life and their businesses. The Freedom Club is about unlocking your talents, turning them into strengths, and crushing your objectives. You can learn more at KurtMercadante.com. Welcome to the Freedom Club. And welcome to the Freedom Club Podcast. I am your host, Kurt Mercadante, and I am so happy you're here, whether this is your first time listening or your 101st time listening. And you know, there is an entrance fee to listen here. That entrance fee is this. If you hear something you like, please take action in your life. The ability to make decisions and take action is so fundamental. It may seem so easy to you, but I'll tell you what. The number one challenge I see with wannabe entrepreneurs is that they hem and haw, they over plan. They don't take action. They don't make those decisions and move forward. So if you hear something you like here or in another episode, make a decision, take action. The second thing you can do is tell your friends, family, and colleagues about us. Anyone you think would benefit from our message of freedom and fulfillment. And the third thing is this. If you like what you hear, please leave us a positive rating and review. If it's on iTunes, please do it. That's like currency to us. It helps us expand our message around the globe. And we have listeners all around the globe. So again, I am so grateful that you are here and that you continue to come back and listen. We continue to grow month after month. And on today's episode, we have my friend and just Uber marketer. If you're on LinkedIn, I'm sure you've read, seen his videos, read some of his articles. His name's Zach Messler, and he's all about developing a clear, compelling message. Zach made, the, like me and like many of you out there, Zach made the jump from corporate America into his own firm. So he's living that as we speak. We talk about that. We talk about Zach's definition of what freedom means to him. And we also talk about three questions that every single entrepreneur should be asking themselves to ensure success. So without further delay, here is my interview with Zach Messler. So Zach Messler. Thank you so much for being here. Kurt Mercadante. It's my pleasure, man. This is fun. I've been <laughs> wanting to do this for a long time. I love and before, before we get into it, we'll, we'll have to, before we're done here, we'll have to have Zach. So Zach does play by play, not play by play, but you're actually the public address. Public announcer address. For yeah. The public University address. of Maryland women's volleyball, right? Correct. So we'll have to have to do uh, announce a lineup before. Oh, it's super fun. Oh, I oh, I got to get that. I have I could do it. That's super fun. <laughs> I love it. It's uh, it's my happy that's one of my happy places. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um so Zach and I got to know each other earlier this year over the phone. Uh but then we met at No Longer Virtual Atlanta, which or well No Longer Virtual Denver. Sorry, No Longer Virtual. E- excellent. It's not really a conference. It's kind of more of a, I don't know if you'd call it a retreat, a get together, but it's, it's pretty awesome. And it was in Denver. It's going to be in, in Atlanta next year. And we met in person and have been friends ever since. And uh, I've been looking forward to having you on the show. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no longer virtual. It's time for a plug. You should go. Not you, yeah. Kurt. I know you're going. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It, it's it's truly a remarkable event and you're right it's it's probably all of those things yeah yeah and it's it's not it's not one of these like beat you down you know you go to conferences and it's like by the time you're done it's like oh my gosh um it's just two days it's fun it's pretty high energy you did it you did it you and uh, amy blashka and amy was on has been on this show before you and she started off a little I can lift you up dance number. I remember why before. Yeah. We, before oh, yeah. Started, so. it was fun. 
Well, that was great. And, um, and, and at that event, you and Amy talked about finding your why. And uh, so Zach is a master communicator. And um, <laughs> there's a joke that comes to mind with that, but has to do with fishing and being a masturbator, but I won't go there. Um, you're a master communicator. And, uh, but before we get there, and I want to talk all about that and your journey to entrepreneurship, the question I always ask every guest, it's the only set question I have is, what does the word freedom mean to you? And I thought about this because I knew you were going to ask me this. <laughs> so freedom to me is being able to do anything I want without concern. And that concern can be personal concern. It could be concern about, you know, if I'm in a work environment, a concern about what could happen. Um, it could be financial. It could be emotional. It could be, I don't know, but concern. Sure. The ability to do anything I want at any particular time without concern. And is that one reason you made the, G, the leap, the jump off the cliff, you know, into entrepreneurship? Oh, certainly part of it. Certainly part of it. I mean, the core of it was I was helping at most at any particular time, at most a couple hundred salespeople, and I wanted to help more people. Fair. But 100% that plays a part, the freedom piece of it played a part of it, 100%. Because in any role, no matter what your job is, you're, you're reporting to someone. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges I find of being an entrepreneur. I'm not reporting to anyone and I, you know, I have to hold myself accountable, which is all, all, not always the easiest thing to do for me because I'm a big idea person. I just, Oh, look at this one. Hey, how about that? Like, <laughs> when I think of freedom and Zach Messler, I think of, well, so Matt, Zach and I are on the Marco Polo video texting app. And I'd say 90% of the time, Zach's there blasting music in the background. <laughs> I think it's of that, true. the freedom to work and play music as loud as I want. Well, I did that in the office anyway. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I just closed the door. I'd close the door. You, so the last place I worked, I was in an office and then there was a guy next to me. There were three offices in a row. And, and then it was just space. So, so it was me this one guy and then this, and then this woman in the far office, the guy in the middle was only there a couple of days a week. So I didn't turn it up, crank it. <laughs> it all the time. You know, one of the, one of the, when you talk about pre entrepreneurship and working in a corporate environment versus working for yourself now, and some of the challenges are different that you don't have a boss or someone to report to, but that, that becomes a challenge. You know, there's two types of stress. There's you stress and de-stress. New stress is, you know, fight or flight. All right, the, the, hundred, the, the gun went off and I'm running 100 meters, you know. Distress is you get beat down. And, you know, there's two types of stress. Have you noticed a difference in this, that, that there's stress and there's fear, but it's a different type of fear now than you had when you were in the corporate job? Uh, you know, I used to have a fear of, oh my God, I got to make the meeting. I got to make the court. I got to do this. And now it's like, all right. I got to, I got to bring home the bacon, right? I got to go out and I got to do it. But it's, it's more of a feeling that I used to have before running a race versus like, I feel trapped and I, I want to punch my way out of this prison. Yeah. Well, for sure. It's different. It's totally different. Although I will say I, it was, I was probably about a year and a half in the last place I worked and the, the, I, I didn't see eye to eye with the approaches that were being taken from a marketing and a messaging perspective. And the guy who was running marketing at the time was kind of an old school marketer and nothing wrong with that, but it, you know, focused really on feature benefit, feature benefit, feature benefit. And you can't stand out that way, especially in tech where I, where I come from in, in tech, any feature that you have, anyone else could have in a, in an hour, a day, a month, you know, whatever. So even your differentiated features aren't really differentiators, you know, unless it's patented stuff, but I mean, that gets a little more complex. Right. So I didn't believe in that. I believe buyers have changed. 
in B2B and B2C. I mean, buyers have changed. I'm actually writing a piece on this right now, but it's because of this. I'm holding my phone. It's because of the phone, right? So the, the iPhone, when the iPhone came out, everybody started to change and we're all different now. I mean, you think about today, it's like the selfie generation, right? Or the right. selfie, it's not even generation. It's the selfie world. It's, it's not, hey, I'm going on vacation. Check out my vacation. And it's like pictures of a sailboat. It's, hey, check out me on my sailboat on vacation. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's not like, hey, I'm at the U2 concert. Check out, look, it's Bono. No, look, I'm in the front row. It's me and Bono. It's, yeah. It's me, me, me. And, and so if as, a, as any company or an entrepreneur, <laughs> entrepreneur, anybody who's putting out a message that the first message, the word is we or I, doesn't play, doesn't fit. It's not about you. And people say, oh, well, my benefits, the benefits that my product has are all about the, the buyer. Or they're all about the user. No, they're about your product. They're about what your product does for that user. Whereas today, what you have to do, I believe what you have to do, is demonstrate how the buyer will feel when they use your product or use your offering. Right. And it's, it's slightly different. It's, it's not easy to do. Um, but it, and, and it's very different from we do this. Yeah. You know, or, or even, you know, there's a, a big kick now, at least in the entrepreneurial space, is, is, is what's your message? And, and they all start with, I help. I help fill in the blank. Yeah. Find fill in the blank by doing fill in the blank. But the problem with that is it's all about you. It's not about your audience. They might relate to it, but it's about you. It's interesting because uh, so two weeks ago, I did a, a speech to the American Marketing Association, their Charleston chapter, and it, on purpose-driven storytelling. And um, what I talked about was, all right, you should know your purpose for your company. And if you're an entrepreneur, your company is an extension of who you are. It should be. Um, but then I talked about it's about the impact. And I, I, I put a big, on my slide, a big poop emoji. And I said, the reason I have my friend the poop emoji is here is just to to drill down the fact that no one gives a shit about your product, your bells, your whistles, this and that. And I thought, you know, someone who was way ahead of the curve on this was Steve Jobs because when he came back to Apple and right in the speech when he launched the Think Different campaign, he said, listen, we spend a fortune on branding and advertising for Apple and you wouldn't even know it because, but he said the way we have to come back is not to talk about megahertz and processor speeds, not to talk about how much better we are or how bad Windows is. And so they came up with this, with a vision statement that was purpose and impact. So it's, yeah, know your purpose. What, what impact are you gonna have on the end user? Uh, and um, it, it really is, once you can define what that is, that's when people start, like you said, to picture, okay. You know, he, he launched Think Different. He, he had Albert Einstein, Muhammad Ali, and Martin Luther King Jr. didn't even show the product, you know, and it was about people with passion can change the world. It's like, was there anything about an iPod, a computer, a, nothing? So yeah, so it's great. Yeah, he made those things irrelevant. Yeah, People just wanted it. <laughs> I mean, at some point, at some point, and, and this could be coming from a, a world where in B2B tech, you know, enterprise technology, it's almost always an incredibly complex sale because you have buying group of multiple people. It's a multi-million dollar investment on the part of the buying organization. So at some point, I believe you do have to have that statement. I do this. You do have to talk about your features and your benefits and all that stuff. But it's not until that the buyer of your stuff says, hey, I want to know about this stuff. Right. Yeah, I wrote, a, I wrote a rant. You said nobody gives a shit about your product. I wrote a rant on this. Most of my early stuff on LinkedIn, I started writing on LinkedIn mostly for, you know, self-therapy. <laughs> <laughs> like, because I was seeing stuff that I didn't agree with. And so I'd write something because it was a lesson. It was a lesson for anybody out there. 
and it was cathartic for me. So one of the first things I wrote, um, I'm, I'm sure, well, I'm sure it's still there. Of course it's still there is, is a rant. And it was this 60 second rant can help you sell more stuff or something like that. But it starts off. Nobody gives a shit about your product. Nobody <laughs> cares how great you are. Yeah. All those accolades, testimonials, features, events, customer lists, nobody cares. Nobody cares unless, unless it addresses or the problem that haunts them, you know, unless it, and, it, and talked about, and then I gave a, a primer of here's how you make your messaging stick. But it, it's, to me, the first rule of product messaging is you don't talk about the product. Yeah. Yeah. And that's different than it used to be, right? Because- um, absolutely it, yeah my dad used to get so mad because he was used to marketing way back when at like car commercials that didn't talk about the features of the car you know there was one and it would like show them just speeding and they were talking it was like a person talking at the camera he's like this is so stupid he would get so fired up <laughs> you know of course my dad bought one car every you know 10 years and so the, leather. <laughs> yeah i mean that's what he wanted to see and uh, well google's vision statement you know is it's something like making all the world's information accessible in one click and i use that as an example it's like oh wait they didn't mention google docs or slides or sheets or driverless cars, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's about that one thing. Impact. It's that one. That's right. It's yeah. the one thing. It's that one thing and everything else wraps up underneath it. It's funny you say car ads because that article I was talking about that I, I come back to car ads all the time. Yeah. Because you look at car ads largely before 2007 and they're all, they're all about the company, all of them. They're all about the company. Uh, my favorite ones to poke fun are uh, to poke fun at are the Lexus ones with the smarmy announcer guy who you'd know. You know the Lexus RX three hundred and fifty, putting <laughs> the world on notice yet again. <laughs> it's, like, it's smarmy and gross. And then you contrast that with uh, my favorite ad is ever. My favorite ad of all time is an ad from two thousand sixteen for the Subaru Forester. And it's called, you know, these ads, they're, you know, they're done by big agencies. They have names. They, people don't realize it. Ads have titles. They have names. So it's called Checking on the Kids. So if you search Subaru Checking on the Kids, you'll see it. But it's, um, it's not that many words. But the first word is all telling. The first word of that ad is you. And it says, you can check on them. You can worry about them. You can even choose a car for them. And what's going on is you see these nervous parents so checking on their, you know, checking the, whoops, checking the, uh, checking the candy, unwrapping the candy, making sure there's, it's safe. You know, you see a guy sitting in his, in his Subaru with, you know, with the paper, you know, looking over the paper uh, at his kid who's playing football, like he's worrying, right? Um, and when it gets to, you can even choose a car for them, you see a car accident. You hear, er, boom, and the screen goes white, and you hear the mom, and she says, the driver, and she says, honey, are you okay? And you hear this little pip squeaky voice in the back, go, I'm okay. And it is just, it's awesome. And then it's love. It's what makes a Subaru a Subaru. But it's not about a car. It's about your kids. It's about safety. It's yeah. about protecting your kids and making sure they're safe. And it's awesome. It was just such an awesome ad. It's, uh, yeah, it's that impact that you want. When I was in Cairo a couple of weeks ago, they, there was a bunch of startups and we were trying to, you know, work, hone on their vision, you know, purpose, but impact. And there's a guy who had a telemedicine um, startup. And it, this, it's pretty cool. And I won't get into what it did because that would violate what I'm about to say, but there was the founder who was a doctor who was being pretty quiet. And then there was his guy, his young guy who was like running the show. And we worked on two days. We, we weren't supposed to work. We were supposed to work for vision for like two hours. And then I was going to move on. We just stuck because they could not get out of the features, the buttons, to, you know? So the one guy who was running the thing, I was like, okay, his vision kept getting longer and longer. I'm like, no. And he wanted to talk about the AI component. He wanted to talk to the messenger bot. He wanted to talk about all this. And he kept talking. And I was like, all right, please be quiet. <laughs> and I turned to the doctor. 
And I said, Doc, why did you start this company? He said, 24 seven access to healthcare. I said, is that going to make it more affordable? He said, yes. I said, is it going to save lives? Yes. So it's going to save lives by providing 24 seven access to affordable healthcare. He said, yes. I said, write that down, please. That's your vision statement. You know, cause it wasn't yeah. about the, I said, you may not use a messenger bot in three years. When uh, Steve Jobs left, the iPod hadn't even been invented when he gave the speech that I talked about earlier. Google, when they came up with their vision statement, I don't know what year it was, but I, I guarantee there's a lot of stuff that Google's doing now that didn't even exist when they, you know, so yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. What you just said, I mean, this is what I, I see with tech companies all the time. So in my business, I work with two different audiences. I work with entrepreneurs, but I, and I, I help them know what to say and how to say it. And then I also work with B2B tech companies because it's where I come from, it's what I know, and I love it, and it's super fun. But one of the first things that I'll do when working with a, a B2B tech company is we get to the essence. What's the essence of you, of your company, of your product? What's the essence? And it's really important to be able to do this because if you get to the essence, that core idea, then you can riff on it. You know, it's perfect. It's perfect for, for sales enablement. It's great for marketers, but it, it, what it does is it gives you this base understanding of what it is, what it does and why it matters to your buying audience. And when you have those things and, and you, you've written them out, you've created them in such a way where it's pop, 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 you get it, you get the essence. Um, you know, I've done this a zillion times. Um, I, I've actually done it on other podcasts too, but like I'm holding a glass. So we'll, we'll use this as an example. What is it? It's a, Cylindrical glass container. That's what it is. What does it do? It holds liquid. Why does it matter? Well, sometimes you do a podcast and you know you you want to have something to drink, but you know, you're not sure if the host is going to use the video or not, so you don't want to use the bottle because that would be kind of rude. So you have this glass and it holds your liquid, it keeps it cold because you can put ice in it, and it allows you to look, well, kind of professional as you sip your water. And Everyone listening, by the way, he's, he's, got a, he's got bourbon. It's not water. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's another podcast, man. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, that's a great point. We, uh, at that American Marketing Association thing, I, I asked some people to say, who are you and what do you do? And they all answered with their job title and what they physically do during the day, you know, and I urge them get to your, what is your essence? You know, are yeah. you, are you a mother? Are you a father? Like, what do you do? So I had my retreat last week and it was a job title free zone until the last, that was the very last thing. I love it. And so the question is, who are you? And they had to describe who they were. It was all men. They had to get down to the essence of who they were as men and it was, you know, it was hard, you know, to do because it's so, what do you do? I'm vice president of operations for whatever. And you come to value yourself as that. It's like, well, what if you lose your job? That's why people who get retire uh, voluntary or involuntarily sometimes go into depression. They lose their value. They're almost dehumanized. Or moms who have completely valued themselves only as moms. And by their family, the kids leave. And then all of a sudden you got two parents who value themselves by job title or, you know, or, or job title at home. And they look at each other and they're like, Oh, nice to meet you. What the hell do we do now? You know, but get <laughs> you know, the word, the essence, getting to the essence of, well, it's important. Yeah. It's important. you you are anybody. You are so much more than your job title. You're so much more than your job title. I remember I had an interview years and years and years ago, um, uh, and actually, there was a long time that I wish I had gotten this job. I didn't get it. And I didn't get it because I couldn't answer that one question. So I was young. I had just managed the PR campaign for Pinnacle All-Star Fan Fest. Fan Fest, so it was the, basically the, the roaming, roving baseball theme park that travels with the Major League Baseball All-Star game year to year. <laughs> and and uh, Pinnacle was a card company, a trading card company. And they were the title sponsor. And I did a good job. We had record turnout for the event. Pinnacle was thrilled. 
um, took some creative approaches in PR and it was super fun. So I had an interview, I got an interview and it was to be the brand liaison for Pinnacle at All Star Fan Fest every year. It was an awesome, awesome gig. And I was young too. I mean, I was, let's see, I was like 25 years old. It was, it was dream job in baseball. I love baseball. Oh my gosh, dream job. Yeah. And I'm cruising around the interview and I'm kicking butt. And then I meet the VP of sales. And the first thing he says to me is, so who is Zach Messler? And I froze and I had no idea. Like, uh, 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 and I blew it and I blew it <laughs> and I didn't get the job, which is probably good. I would have had to move to Texas. You yeah. Know, I was dating my wife at that point and who knows what would have happened. I mean, we would have been long distance and you know, I don't know. Texas, yeah. is, really, Texas is really far from DC. <laughs> In many ways. Yeah. yeah it's true. <laughs> Very true. So, you know, you and I have had a lot of discussions about vision and who you are and what you do. And, um, and it, it's interesting because when, when you talk about your vision and you talk about marketing and, and, and working with people on what to say and how to say it, you know, you, you described once, and I won't put the words in, my, in your mouth, but um, about that effective communication is more than just about selling things. And it is, there is a little bit of freedom that goes along with it because it's not just about influencing people, but knowing how to communicate either your product story or your story or just to effectively communicate. I mean, you talked about, you know, working with your kids to do it can open up the world to you, right? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. I believe you can get anything you want out of communication. And it's all about how, it's about how you communicate. It's of course what you say, but it's how you say it. And I believe that to be effective with communication, you have to be clear. So you have to be understood. You have to be compelling. You have to grab attention and hold on to it. And you have to be convincing. You have to compel an action that you want people to take. Clear, compelling, convincing. And if you're those three things, you're going to be perfectly understood for your audience, whoever they may be. Now, from a freedom perspective, I was thinking about this too. Of those three, yes. So communication, I believe, can give you a type of freedom. However, to be compelling, you have to have that freedom mindset first. And let me explain. So I believe to be compelling, most people say, oh, to be compelling, oh, I, I'm not that creative. Oh, I, I, I'm... I'm nervous. I'm scared of what people are going to think. Well, that's, that's not being creative. You don't have to be creative. You have to be willing to take a risk. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. And it's, it's funny. It takes a certain amount of freedom to be able to do that. Going back to earlier in this conversation, when we were talking about when I was in the corporate world, there was a point at this company where I didn't see eye to eye, so to speak. I mean, that's kind of a weird way of putting it, but was, was not in alignment with the approach that was in place. I was ready to leave and I didn't want to leave. Uh, company had a product. I'm in product marketing the company had a product that still does. It's absolutely killer, killer. product. Yeah. Didn't want to leave like my colleagues didn't want to leave. So I made a decision and that decision was, I'm just going to do what I think is the right thing to do. And then I'm not going to be afraid of anybody or anything. Cause what's the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing that could happen is I get fired. I was ready to quit anyway. Okay, fine. Worst thing that happens is I have to find another job, but I'm ready to find another job anyway. And as soon as I started doing that, that's when things blew up in a very good way. It's when I got much closer to the sales force. It's when all of the, the you have to do it this way conversations ended. And that's when I determined or really discovered, I should say, that to be compelling, it's, it's about guts more than it is creativity. Yeah. You can build creativity. You can, you can come up with different things. You can learn how to be more creative. But, you know, 
you have to have the guts to put yourself out there and you can't worry about what anybody else is going to think. Oh, I'm going to hurt my brand. Yeah. Right. Right. You don't, if you don't have, if you're that afraid, you, you don't have a brand, you're vanilla. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Well, it's, I think of your, your videos and posts about pissing people off. I mean, it's, that's comp you're being compelling. You know you're being compelling if either people love you or people and or I guess people hate you. If yeah. you if you're getting that vis almost visceral reaction to stuff that you're putting out there, that's a good thing. And it doesn't matter where it is on that spectrum. It really yeah. doesn't. In my uh, in in that same talk, it's interesting. Uh, so on that point, I. I gave everyone the disclaimer. I said, I'm going to talk about politics, but from a purely marketing perspective. So if you can't handle it, like, please leave the room. Right. But I talked about in 2008. Um, and I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go back to a point you made earlier, but then come around to the point you just made in 2008. Um, McCain, Senator McCain, you know, Everyone respected his record. He was running a resume campaign and it was country first. It was his, his slogan. And it was all about, not only his resume of service, but Obama's resume, where he went to church, attendance records and things like that. And it was, it was working for a while. He was like up nine or 10 points coming out of the convention, but then you had the meltdown, the financial meltdown, right? People are scared. At that point, it's not country first, it's my family first. And they were lacking one word, hope. And Shepard Ferry painted the thing. The Obama campaign ran with it. He won. And I said, listen, we could debate whether or not he represented hope. It doesn't matter from a purely marketing standpoint. Fast forward to 2016. Hillary had three different slogans and she couldn't decide on one. They were all about her. It was resume again. It was, um, uh, I'm with her, you know, fighting for us. Well, who's fighting for us? Well, I'm fighting for you, but not like, where, where are we going though? What, what's going on? And David Axelrod actually had a quote that said, you know, Hillary had a, she couldn't find it, but then Donald Trump came out and she found her purpose in Donald Trump. And if you go back to what Steve Jobs said, we can't define our purpose by how bad or much better we are than Windows. That's what she was doing. And, you know, you love Trump or hate Trump, make America great again. Everyone remembers it. And for the people who love Trump or don't even love Trump, but for, for a lot of people uh, in Wisconsin and Michigan, whose factories, they longed for a day when their factories came back and their jobs came back and all that. They didn't care about him. They, they overlooked the stuff he was caught on camera saying. All of that. And they were like, yeah, he's, we don't like him. He's a bad dude. But I like make America great again. And so we're willing to overlook all of that weirdness and we're going to do that. And um, so, so back to your point about the features and the buttons, and it's not about you. But then even if you look at Obama or, or Trump, they are so happy with having haters because Trump elicits such a visceral response. Obama used to as well. Obama was masterful at turning around his political opponents and, and Trump to some degree is too. I mean, I don't think people know how to deal with him. And so they, you know, they do things like release crazy DNA tests and, dig a hole for themselves, but they're fine. Apple's fine with having haters. I mean, there are people who are viscerally, viscerally upset about, like I have an iPhone. Oh, it's the evil empire. <laughs> and they make fun of people like the fact that people wait out in the rain, sleet and snow to wait for an iPhone. And you know, Android lovers make fun of it. Apple's fine because they, they charge 2,500 a laptop and a thousand dollars a phone. They're fine yeah. with the haters. So That's your right. point about that, elicit that response and you're winning. <laughs> Absolutely, a hundred percent. So, I mean, this is when when we first met. I I was kind of towards the beginning, you know. Well, well not kind of. I was at the beginning, and I was starting to put stuff out there. And I got a couple couple haters on on social media, and it was awful. And I remember my first unsubscribe. So I have an email <laughs> list. It's kind of small. I haven't done a ton of promotion on it, but I got my first unsubscribe. And it hurt, and I took it so personally. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and yeah. and now, that's a good thing to me. If if someone unsubscribes, that's a good thing because it means they're not right for what I do for my message, and that's fine. And it's the same thing with haters. Like an unsubscriber may not be a hater. That's not sure. really that's sure. not fair. But 
but a hater on social media, the, the troll, that's a great thing because it means that my message is getting a reaction. And you always want the ones, oh, this is so excellent. Oh, I, I love this. Oh, it's like you're in my head. That's awesome. I love hearing that. But I've gotten to the point that I also love getting the, the posts, you're a dumbass. Like, like right, that's right. awesome. Yeah. That's great because, because I, have, I have gotten a reaction out of someone. I've made them think. And that emotion means, hey, I'm on the right track. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's there's some, and there's some people who just can't handle it because they haven't, they haven't. I think a, a big problem is, you know, they get a troll and then they, I'm leaving LinkedIn and social media forever. Oh, and I gosh. think, I think it's because a big reason is they haven't really gotten down to what we talked about earlier, the essence of who they are and who they want to be. And so when somebody pokes at them, if you don't have an essence of who you are, I always say that if you pair, if you have your vision. And your, you know, your purpose and vision and your values and you know your strengths, you're bulletproof. Because then it's like someone comes in from the side and you're just like, yeah, screw you. Screw you. I'm going here. If you're unsure of those things, it's like a pinball. Oh, God, they hit me over here and you're over here. And um, for those of you listening, I'm mimicking a pinball. Um, but, but I think that's what happened. And, and a, a lot. And you can tell it because they're just certainly unsure of who they are and, and you know, you can't do, when you, when you're unsure, you can't do the Walter Payton and put your head down and run people over as easily. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. So Zach, a lot of my listeners are people who want a taste of freedom. And so they either start, they start their own company, they leave the corporate nine to five. And there's a lot of challenges that they have depending on, you know, who they are. Sometimes activation is a challenge, but across the board, one challenge that's always there is effective communication and, and getting, so what would you, um, and again, and not, not just of, uh, certainly not of their bells and whistles, but of, of a, what's, what's one thing that you would tell someone who either just started up their side hustle, took a leap from corporate, you know, the corporate nine to five, starting their own company. And they're like, I don't know how to communicate what I'm doing. What's that one golden nugget tip that you would give them? So first, what I would do is it, it's come up with that essence. What is the essence of your offering? What's the essence of what you do? And, and that's the most important thing. It has to be one thing. Um, you, you can have multiple offers, but what you do has to be one thing. And to get that, it's, I, I, I've said this earlier, it's doing that three question exercise. What is it? What does it do? And why does it matter? Now, to do that, what it is and what it does, it's, it's just as few words as possible. It's pop, pop, pop. You have to really get to the, to get to the true essence. It has to be super basic. And, and it's bringing it up because when you're, when you're into something, when you love something and you're, you're putting an offering out, that, out there, you want to get into the details. You get excited talking about it. And you get into the weeds. That's the features and the benefits and the how great this is because of X, Y, Z, one, two, three. But that stuff doesn't matter. That stuff will matter at some point, but it's taking it up a level. So what is it? What does it do? And then why does it matter to the people that it should matter to? So you have an audience. If you're launching a business, you should know who your buying audience is. If you don't, I mean, that's, that's probably the first place to start, understand your audience. But why does your offer matter to your audience? It's taking the buyer perspective. And that's a step that too few people, I believe, too few people take. Everybody's a marketer. They think they know what's right. Um, but it's really, it's like, like we said before, nobody gives a shit about your product. Right. Why does it matter to me? So if you can do that, what it is, what is it, what does it do, why does it matter? You may never use these exact words. That's not the point of this. Right. The point of this is getting to that essence. And once you get to that essence, the rest of the communications will be easy or easier, I should say. So Zach, people are listening to this podcast and they're like, All right, I got to find more out about Zach. I got to hire Zach. I, I got to throw money at Zach right now. Where's the best, easiest place for them to find you? Or place Zach, Zach Messler.com. And that's Zach, Zach Z-A-C-H. 
Yes. Yes. Awesome. ZachMessler.com. And then I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I have a Twitter account. I'm not on quite as much. I retweet a lot of Maryland volleyball stuff and Kurt Mercadante <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, but, um, but yeah, LinkedIn, um, social from a social perspective, LinkedIn and ZachMessler.com. Well, Zach, it has been a long time coming. Really happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, Kurt, thanks to you. Boom, shakalaka. <laughs>